In this video we're going to apply the particle in a box model for the energy levels and see if we can't make a prediction about what wavelengths of ultraviolet and visible light um, these molecules called conjugated polyenes will absorb. So the molecules we're talking about are specifically things like if we start off at the very small just ethylene if I draw in the skeletal structure like this for the pi system you're just going to have two p orbitals which form two energy levels which we have two electrons in the lower level and then you absorb some photon of light and you get pushed up one of the electrons goes into an excited state goes into a higher energy level and similarly if we have 1,3 butadiene now this is a conjugated polyene there are two double bonds here, but the pi systems aren't separate. They function as one continuous pi system. So the electrons can, are kind of spread out between the entire length of these three bonds here. So for those energy levels, we would have access to four pi orbitals, and there's going to be four pi electrons. So we would fill up the electron diagram like this. And then upon absorbing some photon of light, that's not the color I wanted. This is the color I wanted. And upon absorbing some photon of light, then again we have one electron and the highest energy orbital gets promoted one energy level higher. It gets promoted from n equals 2 to n equals 3 here. And we can similarly can keep going on and on and do as large of a molecule as we want to do. But the point here is this is a system which we can use the particle in a box model to try to understand some things about the behavior of what type of light these systems will absorb. So as I said, this is, these polyenes are conjugated, so this whole pi system here acts as basically one big box in which these electrons can move in. Of course, this isn't an exact model, but this is a, this is a you know, little cheap back of the envelope calculation we can do here. The real model would require some very advanced electronic structure theory. But we're going to treat that this electron is in some box with a length L here, which the length L is just the sum of all the length of all the bonds in the pi system. And we're going to pretend that there's no potential inside this box, that the particle is just free to roam wherever it wants inside the box. So this is what the particle in a box model is and that's what we solved the energy levels for in the previous couple videos. So we know that the energy levels given some quantum number n are going to be Planck's constant squared times an integer the energy level squared n equals 1, 2, 3, etc. over 8 times mass of the particle times length of the box squared. So whenever we absorb a photon, we're talking about a change in energy levels. We're talking about a delta E, the, change, the difference in two energy levels, and that's you know between n equals 1 and n equals 2 here. That's between n equals 3 and n equals 4 here. That's getting kind of crammed, so I'm just going to put 2 and 3 there. And here we're going to be transitioning between 3 and 4. So that delta E as we know is Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon which is also hc over lambda the wavelength of that photon and we know that because the wavelength of a photon times its frequency equals speed of light so just substitute in right there so we're interested in the difference in energy between these two energy levels here for a given molecule so we need to subtract the energy of, uh, N, of level N2 from the energy of level N1. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's say E of going from N1 to N2 equals, well, the first part stays the same, the H squared over 8 ML squared and then we have n2 squared minus n1 squared. 
Okay, so that's just a general case, but we have some more info that we can use to get a more specific prediction here. So continuing on, we need to know uh, what are these energy levels going to be. So for that, I'm going to introduce a quantity P, and each of these molecules is going to have a different value for this quantity P. So P is just going to be the number of double bonds in each of these molecules. So half of the number of pi electrons, um, half of the number of P atoms in the system, the number of pi bonds in the system. So we have P equals 1, P equals 2, P equals 3. And this is just going to be help us with some bookkeeping going on here. So if we use this P, then what do we have for these energy levels here? Well, we're going to have that N2, as we can see for P equals 1, N2 is 2, P equals 2, it's 3, 3, 4. N2 is just going to be P plus 1, number of double bonds plus 1. It's going to go to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital to use that type of terminology. And for N1, we want to, we want to go from the highest occupied molecular orbital. So for, for P equals 1, that's 1. P equals 2, it's 2. So this just equals P. So calculating out the value of this quantity in parentheses here, this N, N2 squared minus N1 squared, that's going to be P plus 1 squared minus P squared. And that is going to equal, if we multiply that out, P squared plus 2P plus 1 from the first part minus P squared. Then we know that that's going to cancel out the p squared. p squared minus p squared is going to cancel out. And so we're left with just 2p plus 1. So this quantity in parentheses here is just going to end up being 2p plus 1. But that's not the only thing that changes. The length of the box also changes. So we need to find a value for what L is going to be. So we know L is going to be equal to uh, the length of all of these bonds in the pi system here. So in this system, we've got double, we've got carbon-carbon double bonds, and we've got carbon-carbon single bonds, all of them between sp2 carbon atoms. And if you were to look up values in a table for what typical values of these might be, you'll find that the bond length for a cc double bond between sp2 carbons will be something like 1.34 angstroms, or you know, one angstrom equals 10 to the minus 10th meters. And for a CC single bond between sp2 carbons, you'll get something like 1.47 angstroms. So for this case, we're just going to use an average of these two, make the calculation a little bit simpler, a little bit cleaner. And it's a crude model system anyway, so we can make a simplification. We're just going to use that that bond length equals, let's say, 1.39 angstroms. Kind of right in the middle there. So our bond, so our length then is going to be the number of these 1.39 angstrom bonds. So for P equals 1, we've got one of them. For P equals 2, we've got three of them. For P equals 3, we've got five of them. So this is actually going to equal the value of R times 2P plus 1. Okay, so then going back down here, uh, if we want to look at what this wavelength is, then we can also say that lambda, substituting this here, is going to equal HC over delta E, HC over the change in the energy there, C being the speed of light. So when we look at this, what we are going to end up with is, if we continue this up here, lambda equals, we're going to have HC, then from our delta E equation, uh, we can invert this, we're going to have 8 ml squared
over h squared and then the inverse of n2 squared minus n1 squared that to the minus 1 okay so what we can do right now is say that this square cancels with that h because that's on top that's on bottom and then this speed of light is going to be in there so our next step is to say that lambda the wavelength of absorption is going to be 8 m c over h and now I'm just going to go ahead and substitute in the value of L here. So L is R times 2P plus 1, number of double bonds and length of that carbon-carbon bond. And that's going to be squared, so I'm just going to go ahead and square those quantities. R squared, 2P plus 1 squared. Over, and then this N2 squared minus N1 squared, we calculated down here, and we found that that was 2P plus 1. 2 times number of double bonds plus 1. Dupe. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, error note. This is a minus because we have 2p minus 1 bonds here. Sorry about that. This is going to be a minus. So that makes this a minus here as well. 2p minus 1 squared. Okay, so this is our final equation for the wavelength. When we were talking about uh, this equation down here, this was completely general, but we said we had more information here that this, uh, what energy levels we're transitioning between is specific for uh, alkenes for these types of pi systems here. And then specific, more specific to each given uh, molecule we're talking about was what the length of the box is going to be, and that depends on what the number of bonds is across the total system. So how does this model stack up if we look in comparison to experiment? Well, if we, lo if we look at P versus the wavelength that we calculate with this, if you actually plug in values and calculate this for a given value of P, and if you look at that versus some experimental values, which I've looked up, for p equals 1, you predict 20 nanometers. And the experimental value is 171. Now that's off by quite a bit, but for such a crude model, it is actually on the correct order of magnitude almost. It's 90% error. It's about a factor of 10 off. For n equals 2, you get 114 nanometers versus 217, so that's for 1,3-butadiene. There it's about a 50% error, about a factor of 2, getting better. Then n equals 3, you would predict 228 if you plug in n equals 3, or plug in p equals 3. And your experiment is 258, so that's getting better. We're now quite on the same order of magnitude, and we've gotten the first digit right. n equals 4, you're going to have 350 nanometers versus 304 nanometers. And that's going to, that can continue on dot, 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 as far as you want to go. But that's basically at this point, we've hit the crossover. So the calculated value of the wavelength is going to start being larger than experiment. And it's going to start growing faster than experiment as you continue on. You see on the top here, we've got something that depends on p squared. On the bottom, we've got something that depends on p, so p squared over p. You're going to get something which depends approximately on, on p linearly. So for very large values of p, uh, the wavelength is going to grow linearly. And you can already start to see this by the time we're getting to n equals 3 or 4. So for such a crude model system, this is obviously not correct. A, a pi system in a molecule isn't zero potential inside some fixed well here. For such a crude model system, the fact that we're making predictions which are actually on the correct order of magnitude is quite impressive. So it shows that we're actually on to something using quantum mechanics and using these types of model systems to get some insight into these physical systems. It can predict this trend also that as you get to larger and larger pi systems, you'll get lar larger and larger wavelengths for the absorption. And then uh, we're going to use this and 
we'll see in other model systems which are more sophisticated and which mo more closely resemble the actual physical system, we're going to get better and better results as we go on.